the question you're asking me is are there any limits of scientific explanation uh, not um, uh, will there ever be any limits to science explanation so I think the distinction I'd make is of course there are a large number of things that we don't not only that we don't know that we don't know how to go about finding out what we don't where we don't know it um, the most obvious one is the origin of life where there's there is a um, so far unfilled gap between um, molecules interacting and the emergence of biological systems. We, we don't know how to go about filling that gap. That's not the same as saying that we know that we can't fill that gap, so that that is a, a known limit to science. So in that sense, I'm afraid I'm going to be rather sitting on the fence. We know there are things that we don't understand at the moment, what we don't know is whether they are things that will be understandable or whether they will forever be beyond our grasp. And I, I simply believe that we do not know the answer to that question. We don't yet know whether there will be questions. We know at the moment there are questions. What we don't know is whether these questions will forever be beyond our um, means of answering them. You see, if you if you go back 100 years, 150 years, um, there's there's a very well known example, and it's it's not fair to single this out, but it's a well known example of the uh, French philosopher Comte, who said he was thinking about what things will forever be beyond our knowledge, and the example he came up with was the composition of stars. Well. It was only a matter of 20 or 30 years before um, Helmholtz Bunsen came up with spectral theory and provided us with the means in the beginning of the uh, 20th century to actually find out what stars were made of. So it's very difficult to predict issues that will forever lie beyond the uh, limits of scientific endeavour. There's a big, big um, issue here um, because uh, the naive reductionist view is that we can analyse um, everything into its simpler constituents and once we understand the behaviour of the simpler constituents we can put them back together again and um, explain the events we see at one level in terms of these elementary causes at another level. Now, um, I think even Plato understood that naive reductionism was not um, a universal theory, it was not correct. Um, today we understand even more that you can't actually make that backward step so there will be phenomena that you can't look at and analyse for their constituents and um, explain their behaviour, that's to say the cause, behaviour is cause and effect, explain cause and effect by coming at the systems through an analysis of what they consist of. Now, that leads to people to think that reductionism is dead and we have to take holistic approaches. Now, I think that's going too far. The fact that you can't work backwards doesn't mean that there isn't a story which operates in the forward direction. It's the same with any dissipative system. You can't work backwards through the processes that form galaxies or whatever because they're dissipative systems. You have to make a hypothesis as to how these systems might form, you investigate the consequences of your hypothesis, you compare it with observation. Now in that sense, we can still, with so let's say social systems that we can't analyse in terms of cause and effect, we can nevertheless still make hypotheses about the agents that are interacting the way they're interacting, and see if the consequences of those hypotheses agree with, obs with observation. So we can even in systems which have emergent properties. My understanding is that we can still work backwards 
um, we can still not work backwards, but we can still form hypotheses of the rules by which those systems might be operating and by comparison of our theories with experiment determine how cause and effect does work in those systems. Um, if I may say just one or two things more, um, the um, what I've said I think is correct but it has to have one further proviso. Again, naive interpretation of cause and effect doesn't work if you've got nonlinear systems. Um, and so there's, if you mean literally cause and effect, then you give up. But I don't think it's useful to be so prescriptive about it. I think it's much more useful to think of cause and effect as to do I actually understand the system well enough that I can, to some extent, model it and make predictions. And there, with nonlinear systems, we know there are systems where we can actually write down the theory, we can evaluate the theory, and we see um, how inputs become outputs, how, in a naive sense, you might attribute effects to their causes. But at least we can, in, in a general sense, understand the system, even if we don't specifically talk about it as cause and effect because of the nonlinearities.